My, my name is Sean. I'm with Curlink, and we provide <laughs> employee assistance programs. I mean, is it really, isn't that what you think about EAPs right now anyway? EAPs are boring. They're commoditized. If there was a totem pole of benefits, EAPs would be that little face at the bottom, maybe the cook, the chef. Um, but anyway, I did want to thank Tom and Marsha for giving me the opportunity to talk to all of you today, and thank you for taking the time to, uh, to chat with me. So my name really is Sean Fogarty, and I really am the president and CEO of, the president and CEO of Curlink Healthcare. We're a Chicago-based global provider of EAPs. I did say Chicago, home of the 2016 World Series champion Chicago Cubs that are currently undefeated if any of you watched the game last night. So I have had the good fortune of working with Tom and Marsha and the Cypress team for about three years, and the results we've seen are incredible so far. And I think they have less to do with us and more to do with not only the good folks at Cypress, but the folks that they work with too, a lot of the individuals around the, uh, around the room right now. So before we get into the meat of the presentation, I wanna make sure we all know what an employee assistance program is. EAPs in general terms provide short-term counseling for stress and anxiety and depression and substance abuse and relationship issues. They also include services called work-life benefits. Uh, a lot of times free legal consultation, free financial consultation, find a dog sitter if you need one when you go out of town on July 4th. Organizational resources, work-life services, again, generally most employee assistance programs look about the same. Those of you that have experience with EAPs, probably understand that there are three basic types of EAP products. The embedded program, the affinity product, they're typically thrown in with another line of coverage. If you're a broker or maybe the plan sponsor for an employer group, raise your hand if you have an embedded EAP, maybe thrown in for free with disability, life insurance, you're part of an MEC. Um, these programs are, are underwritten on an average annualized utilization rate of 0.25%. That means out of 1,000 employees, two normal-sized people and one really small person use the employee assistance program each year. <laughs> think about the program, though, that we have for Cyprus right now. And I think this is probably indicative of the program we have nationwide, about 40 times that much utilization. And I think most specialty or third-party EAP providers would probably say the same thing. So the old axiom, you get what you pay for, definitely applies to those free programs. Again, those of you with your hands up, we're over there. Um, Carrier-based programs offered by Blue Cross, United, Cigna, Aetna, they have no incentive to resolve cases within the framework of the EAP. It's counterintuitive for them to do so. They lose money if they do that. I'm guessing most of you don't have, whether you are a plan sponsor for an employer or a broker, you probably don't have a lot of clients with that. Um, but those programs also don't have any level of coordination or integration between the EAP and the other components of the strategy that they're recommending to you, whether it's through a broker or, or directly. Um, yeah, and the clinical model for those programs, very different than a standalone product as well. Specialty or third party programs, there's about a thousand of us in the US. It's kind of crazy. We're a little bit like cockroaches. Um, we are a mix of companies like mine that provide truly global programming to small regional hospital systems, which in and of themselves can be very good providers. But for the most part, a lot of us just focus on EAP services, EAP administration. All right. Most EAP programs, most e I, I swore I would never say the term EAP program, Tom, because the P in EAP is program. Yikes. Uh, most employee assistance programs have a similar value proposition. We help employees, as I said before, with stress and anxiety, things that, that, that really distract them, things that keep them unproductive. And we help employers by providing consultation for not only employee productivity issues, supervisor issues, but also crisis events, organizational development, training, on-site services. Most EAPs have those two parts of their value proposition pretty, pretty well sold. But it's the last two bullets that I want to focus on today, since not only are they part and parcel to why we're here today uh, talking about cost containment, but they're also part of a value statement of an EAP that most employee assistance programs don't really adhere to. So for today's session, Two walkaway goals. One, behavioral health is a big deal. Behavioral health costs impact your direct spend, your indirect spend. They, as I said before, distract employees, keep, uh, keep employees unproductive and all that. And two, EAPs, if they're built the right way and they're positioned the right way as a core population health management component, can fill that gap, can address that hole that exists 
in most health management strategies and most cost containment strategies. So before I go any farther, does everyone here have a card? Raise your hand if you do not have a playing card right now. Awesome, thank you to Christine and the team. Uh, I know you have one, I handed you one like five minutes ago. Are you saying, Christine, could you actually give? Awesome. Um, okay, so can everybody with a seven, and I, I'm actually gonna live up to something you were asking for earlier, Tom, can everybody with a seven please stand up for a minute? Awesome. Come on, all of you with sevens, I know there's more sevens in the audience than this. Okay. All right, so I think some of you are sandbagging a little bit. We're gonna be okay with that for the time being. If the entire room, the, the middle part of the room, represents all Americans, what do you think the folks standing represent, other than just being a, a collective of really good looking people? Is it diabetics? Not that I'm accusing anyone. Is it diabetics, though? No, that's about one in 11. Is it smokers? Well, it actually could be, because I only see about one in six standing up, but smokers are about one in six Americans. Is it the percentage of Americans who think the Cubs are gonna win the World Series? <laughs> All right, it's probably gonna be a heck of a lot more than that. Um, no, it actually corresponds to, or represents the number or the percentage of Americans that have a diagnosable mental health condition, about 26%, about one in four. Thank you for standing up, by the way. 26%, it's a big number. It's more than diabetes and cancer combined. Think about how much we spend on treatment mechanisms for diabetes, for cancer, for, for illicit drug use, for smoking, obviously. And one in four Americans has a diagnosable, a serious mental health concern. And that's mental health concerns. I'll draw the distinction between that and behavioral health. A mental health concern or depression and, and bipolar disorder and anxiety disorders like panic. A behavioral health concern, that number doesn't even include folks that have relationship issues or a little bit of stress in their lives. Doesn't include substance abuse problems either. Just mental health, it's a really big number. All right, so I'm sure you can't see the, uh, the, the lines on the screen right now, but even without these figures, it's not hard to build the business case for a resource to address and treat behavioral health concerns. Behavioral health concerns like anxiety, stress, depression, the ones that I was mentioning before, they impact your direct costs, of course, but they also impact your human capital costs in the form of absenteeism and productivity and turnover. Think about all the resources in your arsenal, your population health management arsenal, to, to address physical health concerns. And we've got a lot of vendors here today that are doing a great job of that. Health coaching, and on-site and near-site clinics, telemedicine, disease management. The only benefit out there that really is designed specifically, to a, to specifically focused to address mental health, behavioral health concerns, is an employee assistance program. And I mentioned before, I, I know how EAP is perceived. It's that bottom of the totem pole benefit. It's the last kid kick for kickball. So let's go back to the anatomy of an EAP slide. At, at 10,000 feet, I appreciate that most employee assistance programs probably look alike. Those embedded programs probably, again, at 10,000 feet, look a lot like the program that we would offer, that we offer through Cypress. So if most EAPs look alike, what features, what, what core components will allow it to fill the gap that exists in most health management strategies and really function effectively as a cost containment vehicle? First, look for a provider with a strong clinical model and one that's accountable for delivering clinical outcomes. The catalyst for our program success, the reason that we can integrate with the other components that Cypress is recommending to their clients, the other health management components, that is. The gas that fuels our engine. Every single call into the EAP around the clock, 24-7, 365, is not only answered directly by a master's or PhD level licensed clinician, that in and of itself is a differentiator, but we empower these folks to conduct comprehensive behavioral health assessments. I mean, think about the value that that gives to your self-funded plan. We're essentially taking cases away from a self-funded plan that would have been outpatient counseling cases, that would have cost a self-funded plan around 620 bucks each, and we're redirecting them probably to the same provider within the employee assistance program. These folks, ah, I did that myself earlier, sorry. These folks are also cross-trained to identify and refer members with comorbid health conditions to the right level of care, the right treatment opportunity. So if someone calls us with depression, for example, and we realize that the depression is the result of a recent weight gain, of course we're gonna treat the depression within the employee assistance program, but we're gonna refer that individual over to health coaching, maybe even disease management if that, if that health condition is chronic. Let's make sure that we're playing well in the sandbox with all of those other programs. And that starts with that first assessment. 
We also take a, a non-linear three-pronged approach to employee engagement. I think it's pretty unique in the EAP world. We want to use promotion to drive organic awareness to employees of, of, of all of your organizations to make sure that they know that the employee assistance program exists. We want to remove the stigma of seeking treatment. How many of you as plan sponsors have an employee assistance program and will actually admit that it's got kind of a negative stigma? It's like the principal's office. Anyone? All right, that's awesome that nobody's raising their hand right now. I hear the same, whoops, sorry. I hear the same thing from a lot of clients that we take over from other EAP providers, and it's probably less a function of the provider and more of a function of just the, the culture of the organization. So let's, let's do what we can through promotion to remove that stigma. Let's lower that bar to access and make sure that everybody with a little bit of stress in their lives calls the employee assistance program. Let's use technology to not only provide resources, of course, but to connect employees with the employee assistance program. There's only so much you can do with promotion. Employees are at the job 40 hours a week. What happens the rest of the time? We know that 97% of Americans have access to the internet and two thirds of Americans have a smartphone. Let's use those two as channels to actually get folks into the employee assistance program. Let's connect with them on their terms, on the weekend, at night, when their spouses drive them nuts watching Dancing with the Stars. Let's use other providers. We're going to talk about integration with other providers here in a moment, but let's actually use other providers as marketing resources. If you have an on-site clinic, and that on-site clinic does not have a licensed behavioral health practitioner, which very few do, let's make sure that there are brochures and posters for the EAP all over that on-site or near-site clinic. Look for a provider that constantly innovates and constantly refines their programs to impact the overall health and well-being of your employees. Finally, let's also look for a provider that has the capacity and willingness to integrate as a core population health management component, to play well in the sandbox, as I said before, with the other components of the strategy that you're recommending to your clients or that you as clients are recommending or building for your employees. Let's exchange referrals. Let's exchange data. Let's actually make sure that if there's a big table where you, you as an employer are talking about population health management, and as a broker, you're suggesting this for a client. If you have a vendor summit, for example, let's make sure the employee assistance program is not only part of that discussion, but that is exchanging, that we're exchanging data, exchanging referrals, and exchanging marketing with everybody else. Um, I gave the on-site clinic example before. Let's talk about dental for a minute. And this actually came up with a client of ours, GoDaddy, that had a vendor summit about a month and a half ago. And the dental provider stood up and said, well, why aren't we integrating with the EAP? Can anybody tell me why a dental provider, why dental insurance should be integrated with an EAP? Does anybody have TMJ? Raise your hand if you do. OK. One person with TMJ. Wow, that's a really small uh, number in this room. So one person with TMJ. TMJ obviously is caused a lot of times by stress and anxiety. So if we know that employees have stress and anxiety, we can actually reach out and engage these individuals with the employee assistance program. It's not a witch hunt. We're not calling them and telling them, hey, we know you have TMJ. Even if it's something as benign as a home mailer, a, a hey, did you know you had? Hey, did you know you had access to this great program? We're targeting the low-hanging fruit opportunities where we know we can have a real impact. And all of this integration is done on a group-by-group -group basis, sensitive to the individual culture of each client. Providers that could do all these things typically have pretty good results. And we released a case study two years ago and then again about a month ago that evaluates outcomes and impact from thousands of EAP cases over the last couple of years. Folks that use the program are more productive. They're absent from work less often. And they have better health and reduced acuity if they have substance abuse or depression-related issues. And the numbers that I think you really want to see, because we are talking about cost containment, there is a, a, a causal impact on claims for folks that use the employee assistance program. 30% reduction in outpatient claims, 22% reduction in cases, and a 60% reduction in out-of-network utilization. We talked about in-network and out-of-network costs yesterday a little bit. I mean, how often or how many times have you thought about an employee assistance program being able to have that kind of impact? Well, when we make a referral to one of our 15,000 clinicians across the country for face-to-face -face counseling, we're making a referral to someone who also participates in the member's mental health network. So that in the event, in the unlikely event that the case is not resolved within the EAP, and it's resolved about 92% of the time, that 8%, that member's not going to have, that employer, that member's not going to have to retell their story to someone new at your self-funded plan's expense. They're going to transition into the benefit plan with the same provider. Last year, Curlink also released a financial offset dashboard that estimates the, and I hate to call it a financial offset dashboard, it's kind of a fancy name for an ROI calculator. 
but it estimates the return on investment for EAP for prospective and for current clients, all 55 or so clients that we have with Tom and Marsha, have this at the bottom of every one of their utilization reports that generally they get from us on a quarterly basis. And it, 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 estimates the, the, sorry, it estimates the impact of the program on medical cost savings and on human capital cost savings. Medical cost savings obviously are very hard dollar. Human capital cost savings, it's evidence-based, it's super conservative, but as you can imagine, it's a little bit soft dollar. The average ROI for all current clients, 600 and some odd clients and almost a half a million employees, is just under five to one, but it's a higher ROI. We deliver a higher ROI for clients that follow some best practice recommendations that I'm gonna go into in a minute, which Cypress does to a T, and their financial offset is around seven and a half to one. All right, so as, as brokers, as consultants, and as plan sponsors for employers, what can you take away from this? Make sure you're integrating the employee assistance program as a core population health management component. Don't make it an afterthought, especially if it's one you're paying for already. Put us to work, make us accountable. Leverage promotion, technology, and other benefits providers to connect employees to the EAP, to market it appropriately. There should be no employee at any of your organizations that doesn't know that the EAP exists. You don't get utilization without awareness, and you don't get value without utilization. Position the employee assistance program as a parity compliant entry point to the mental health component of the group health plan. Now this is gonna be a little bit tricky. With Cyprus, for example, this works perfectly. We're listed on the insurance card. As Holly and I were talking about earlier, Cyprus' medical management providers refer cases over to us that may unnecessarily go into the benefit plan, which boosts EAP utilization a little bit. Um, but if you have experience with carriers, Blue Cross is probably a little bit easier than, than maybe a Cigna, but it is gonna be a little bit tricky from time to time to get us listed on the insurance card. But if you can, a lot more people are gonna use the program for either you or if you're a broker for your clients. Here's a five session EAP model. The average outpatient counseling case lasts about six sessions, and as I mentioned before, cost a self-funded plan around 622 bucks. That six sessions is not moderated by UM, it's not moderated or managed by CM. A provider and, and the participant are kind of left to their own devices to finish the case whenever they think it's, it's relevant, which means the provider is gonna make that case go on maybe a little bit longer than he or she should. We're holding our providers accountable. We're following up with them after every other session to make sure they, like us, are focused on resolving the case within the framework of the EAP. So for that reason, we can see similar results with a five session model than these folks would otherwise see in the benefit plan. We can actually drag that 6.1 down to a little bit below five. Uh, almost three quarters of our clients have a five session model, all Cypress clients do. And as I mentioned before, 92% of cases are resolved in this model. You don't need an eight session model. Resolution rate's about the same. You're gonna pay about 30% more. Finally, and I mentioned this before, hold us accountable. Make sure that we are delivering the things that whether it's me or a salesperson on our team, or, or if you work with a different employee assistance program, make sure they are living up to what they sold you or what they sold your clients if you're a broker. But also keep in mind that accountability is a two-way street. As a, as a client, as a plan sponsor, you have to want to promote this benefit to your population because you have to believe that stress and anxiety and depression and substance abuse that they do have an impact on your employees, that they have an impact on your direct cost, your indirect cost, and your workforce as a whole. So I sped through this a little bit faster than I thought I would, knowing that we were gonna be probably short on time, which obviously we're not, because I think I'm doing the same thing everybody else is. Does anybody have any questions for me, employee assistance programs, behavioral health, anything? With that, thank you very much. Thanks,